The Commentary Booth is a show for media lovers by media lovers just like you. If you want to support the show, go to pariomagazine.com.au. Welcome to the Commentary Booth, the ultimate weekly entertainment recap and review show. My name is Jamie Apps, and each week I'll be joined by a rotating cast of co-hosts to run you through the entertainment media we've consumed during the week. Along the way, we'll provide you with insightful commentary and reviews. This week, I'm joined by a DJ who lists their favourite movie as Scott Pilgrim vs. The World and his favourite TV show as Parks and Rec. Welcome back to the show, Jackson Carr. Thanks for having me, my friend. How are you going? Yeah, not too bad. The weather's not too not too shabby at the moment. Can't complain about that. Yeah, it's quite a nice um, autumn day today. I'm looking forward to getting outside soon. Yep. Yeah, and I've finished off this month's issue of the magazine, so now it's just, as soon as we jump off here, it's delivery day. Nice. I um, I saw you, your merch, the jumpers look nice. I think I'm going to have to cop one of the, buy one of those for... When winter comes around, I, I do like my hoodies, that's for sure. Yeah, I just sort of jumped on there and mocked those up today, and they, I think they look pretty good. Yeah, nice. Well, um, I'll, I'll be sure to get one, that's for sure. Alrighty, so... Uh... What have you been watching and doing the last few weeks? Man, besides DJing being hot and cold, like thanks to these new restrictions, I, um, I actually, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of Gladys and how she did the snap, like lockdown with the dance, like you can't dance or whatever, but I am a fan of her Dying Discover vouchers. So I've used both my food ones and I actually went to the movies and I went to Hoyt's Extreme, like on the big screen, the comfy seats that go back and took myself out and I saw the new um, Guy Ritchie movie, Wrath of Man, and that was amazing. I love Guy Ritchie movies. Is this the fourth one he's done with Jason Statham? And every single one is amazing and it's like a really good action heist movie. And I was reading mixed reviews about it, but if a Guy Ritchie movie comes out, I'll say it. Like The Gentleman last year could be one of my favorite movies ever. Like we might. It's top three for sure. And I saw like reviews and I was like, you know what? This is a great action-packed movie. It was full of suspense and it's a movie I reckon I can see again and again, and it's great seeing it at the movies, that's for sure. Yeah, you've got to love those Dine and Discover vouchers. I've, the same as you, I've used both of my food ones, and then I'm trying to get rid of the two <laughs> Discover ones at the moment, trying to work out where to use them. Well, I recommend going to the movies and seeing this movie because it was great. Like, it was just very... Jason Statham absolutely nailed his role. Jason Statham, who actually was a diver for England. I don't know if he went to the Olympics, but there's photos online of him diving um, when he was younger. So he's gone from diving to this big bang action man. So that's my fun fact of the day. Yeah, that's a some career pivot there. <laughs> yeah, like I, I always knew that Vinnie Jones used to play football, like soccer, Chelsea, and that wasn't much of a pivot. But to go from diving, to where you have to be compact and not have big splashes to the big splashing movies, it's... Um, Inspirational, really, that's for sure. What did you think of the movie in terms of like where it ranks on the, the Guy Ritchie scale? Was it sort of up there with The Gentleman or not quite? Nothing will compare to... I, on, the Gentleman is my favourite Guy Ritchie movie. I love Lockstock and Snatch is probably my second favourite. It's not on the podium in the top three and it's not his best work, but it's still amazing. Like I, I can't fault him. Like He's just great at what he does and it's... It's it's up there. Like I'd say top six, top five. I'd have to see it again, but it's it is a movie that you can see it over and over, and it's successful. The acting was great. Like it's just what you wanted in a movie, and it has the whole guy which is storytelling where he goes on a timeline and it jumps around a bit in the timeline, and you see stuff, and you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense now. So it's very very well told by him, and um, I believe it was an adaptation of another movie or a book. I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, it was. It was good and no after credit scene. I stayed till the end despite the fact that I needed to use the facilities and no after credit scene, so you can just leave when it ends. But I was supporting all the, the cast as, as we do. But 
Um, yeah, great movie, great, really good movie. It's something that you you want to see at the, the movies. And if you're in New South Wales and you suddenly just come vouchers, I I say do it and then spend. I spent, I think it was three dollars fifty because I went to the extreme points, or whatever it is, and it was well worth it. Yeah, that's a, the cheapest movie you're going to see in a, a very long time, I think. Yeah, unless it's you taking me to premieres, yeah, it's the cheapest movie that I'll, um, I've seen in a while, that's for sure. Yeah, it sounds like it's one of those movies where as long as you sort of go in with the correct expectations, you're not going to be disappointed. Like, I know some people would have seen it and been like, oh, Guy Ritchie, so they'd put it on this big pedestal and then might not live up to it. But if you go in there with the correct ideas of what what to expect you should be fine yeah definitely like it's got good storytelling it's not as good as these other movies but by all means it's, it's not a bad movie like i really enjoyed it and i i want to i'll definitely see it again at some point and jason stays jason stays in part of me as always it's just those two together it's just great it wasn't as good as he snatched performance which is a movie i still love to this day um but it was it was good Good, good storytelling, suspenseful. It's everything you want in an action movie, and waited an hour and a half, two hours of your life. Yep, and yeah, on that sort of going in with the correct expectations, it kind of ties in with the movie I got to see uh, on Wednesday, Spiral from the Book of Saw, so the latest entry into the Saw series. Okay. So this one is the the ninth. Saw movie, um, but it's it's more of a like soft reboot slash offshoot of the the mainline series. It's not directly tied to the series, as like it doesn't just follow on from a previous story. So that makes it a little bit easier to sort of get into. But then this one stars Chris Rock in the main role. He plays Detective Ezekiel Banks, who's sort of chasing down a jigsaw copycat killer who's targeting corrupt police officers. Seeing Chris Rock in this, like, serious detective role is kind of tough to get past and see past the the comedy. Yeah, I would say that would be the case. Especially because throughout he's, like, dropping all these, like, wisecrack one-liners and sort of miniature stand-up skits about divorce and stuff. And it's like, I think this is supposed to be a more serious, scary type movie rather than this light-hearted, strange feeling that it had. Yeah, no, I I get that. Like, when you said Chris Rock, I I literally jolted. I was like, what? That that doesn't seem right. And I guess you you can compare, like, you know, Marvel movies, they're serious, but they have the one-liners which are funny. And even like Guy Ritchie movies are serious and they had the one lines are funny. I, I've never seen a Saw movie. Spoiler alert. I, I know what they're about. I just I haven't seen one. But yeah, Chris Rock in that kind of role, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's a, like, I, I, I don't think it's something I, I, would be, I feel comfortable with. I know when Adam Sandler did um, that movie and he was serious, he did quite a good pivot. But I don't know. Chris Rock seems too much of like a larrikin for me to take him seriously in that type of role. Yeah, and even like just his voice, like, is very comedic in itself, so it's sort of a little bit tough to get by. And I think with the Adam Sandler one too, it was, it like fully lent into the serious, tense vibe, whereas this one kind of has moments where it's like that, but then it has moments where it's funny and you're like, I'm not sure where we want to sit. Apparently Chris Rock is a massive fan of the Saw series, so that's how he sort of got involved. He was one of the the writers, and then they put him in the starring role, one of only two people to have ever done that with Saw. Wow. So uh, the original is written by Lee Whannell and stars Lee Whannell, but the rest have all just been written by someone and then random actors dropped in. Okay, that's that's an interesting tidbit. I guess if he's a fan, I would have made the movie better because you you know that he knows the whole storyline and it's something he's always liked rather than being an actor that just been just has been thrown in it and has to do their research. So, would would you recommend me using a Dine and Discover voucher for this, or is this something that, as someone that's never seen a Saw movie either, or is this something I can probably wait till it's streaming in a few months? Yeah, this one would be more of a a wait till it's streaming one. Um, 
with Chris Rock having that background with it, it does sort of get back to the roots of the core Saw movies, like Saw 1, 2, and 3, where particularly with the traps, they're much more simplistic and, like, to escape these traps, you just have to do one thing and you're out. Whereas in, like, subsequent movies, like the Jigsaw 1 and I think, like, Saw 6 or 7, it was, like, multiple steps for these people to escape to the point where it was basically impossible to escape. Yeah, we are. Whereas this one, like, the the very opening trap is a man, his tongue is in a clamp, and then he's, like, hanging, or sort of, he's on a platform, but only, like, just on a train line, but, like, being held up by his tongue, basically. So, in order to escape, all he has to do is bite his own tongue off, and then he can walk away. Ooh. But... Like, that's obviously something that you're not just going to be like, okay, yeah, I'll just do that. And he only has a certain amount of time before the train comes, and then, spoilers, the train comes. You just reminded me why I have never seen a Saw movie, because I probably would turn it off after that would happen. I don't have the guts for that. I know I like action movies, but that's just a bit of a no. No, I, okay, (laughs) thank you. I'm I'm, going to, for once, I'm not... I'm not going to see this. Thank you, though. That does. <laughs> Ugh, give me the heebie jeebies. That also wasn't the 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 um trap that had me squirming in my seat the most, though. Like that was relatively tame compared to some of the later <laughs> ones that got very graphic and very gory. And oh, oh no. Okay, no. Thank you for the, this trigger warning. I'm I'm happy to. That's all I need to know about it. Oh, but. If, I guess if you're a fan of that type of imagery, it's something that you can go see. Yeah, I think if you are a fan of the Saw movies, like I am, I, I enjoyed it. I took Lauren's sister. She enjoyed it. But I think if you are someone that's just like, this is your first entry into the Saw movies, it might not be the best one. I would suggest going back to the original. The original is by far and away the best of the Saw movies. Um, there is a nice little homage to the original in this one, but yeah, other than that, probably just wait for a a streaming service for this one. Yeah, okay. It'll be on Netflix or Stan or something at some point. Yeah, no, I um, actually got Stan and Netflix back in the past two weeks, so I only got Stan back for the rugby, super rugby final, but... I'm going to cancel it again. But, yeah, no, I'll, I, maybe I'll grow some balls in a few months and watch it. But, or, an, or, or one of the original saws. I nearly said stand there, pardon me. Yeah, one of the original saws, but, yeah, no. It's, that's, that's, that's nice that you enjoyed it, though. <laughs> yep. Respectfully. Obviously, with all those streaming services back, you watched a, a new show. So I got Netflix back to watch um, a show called Master of None, which Aziz Ansari, Aziz Ansari stars and writes. I saw the first season and I absolutely loved it. Then he went through that whole thing with the Me Too allegations. So I was like, I can't support this man anymore. I don't want to watch season two. But then Rita came out in the past six months ago. I was like, see that he was actually cleared of it. It was actually a bad date and the girl just admitted she was wrong. So I was like, okay, Master of None, I'll, I'll eventually watch it again. And then I saw that season three is coming out in a week, in, in two weeks. So I was like, okay, I have to rewatch this show. And basically, the whole premise of the show is loosely based on Aziz's life, and it's just about being a thirty year, in your thirties and just dealing with the world, whether it's dating or work. And season two was really, really interesting because he started in Italy, and that was wonderful to see. Like, like the, first, the whole first episode was in black and white. It's really. Some of the things they do is like really interesting. So the whole first episode was in black and white. Then the second episode, you got to see Italy. And then like other things of like episodes is there's this one episode where they cover the, the day-to-day life of three different people. And one of the person was deaf. So the whole 10 minutes that we covered her, it was silent. It was just, they were just doing sign and it was subtitles. And it was just silent. And it was just really weird, like watching a television show, knowing that it wasn't on mute and just being like, wow, this is what made you really think about what these people go through. And it was a deaf girl and her partner who wasn't deaf and they did all the sign. And it's just a really thought provocative show. And just 
one episode was like whole movie length and wonderful show. And then season three is actually going to, and then one episode, sorry, was focusing on Aziz's friend who's lesbian and they were like best friends growing up and it was just her coming to terms with who she was and coming out to her family and then inviting her girlfriends to Thanksgiving and the third season is actually all about the, the friend. So it's like a really good show. It's something I've never really experienced before and I can't believe it took me so long to watch it but I'm glad everything got cleared up with him and yeah, as a single man in his 30s in a big city, I, I related to a lot of the concepts of that, that he brought up and yeah, it was, it was quite nice. And he was also talking about his Indian heritage and what it's like being Muslim and having parents that are quite strict with him. And yeah, it was just really insightful into his life as well. Like, great, great show. One of the best series of television shows in a long time, that's for sure. Oh, nice. Yeah, that deaf episode sounds like it would be very similar to the that movie we spoke about last time, The Sound of Metal. Yeah, definitely. I was, I was, watching, I was thinking about that as well, so... It's nice that um, that you've got shows and movies now that are addressing things in society that people have that you don't really think about, whether it's people that are deaf or then you see Dylan Alcott and him promoting disabilities and running his own disability festivals. It's nice that these people are getting a voice and a spotlight and educating us of what I guess they go through and it's, it's wonderful to see, really. And yeah, Master of None, it sounds like it's sort of a very artistic show in terms of it's not just your regular like sitcom series. It sounds like each episode is specifically catered so that it, it conveys the story in the best way possible. Yeah, it's very artistic for the way it's shot, the way everything is. And yeah, the storytelling is, yeah, it's really, I guess you could say it's quite deep considering the issues that they tackle and it's something that you don't really see a lot. And there was this one episode... I don't know if it was the first or the second season, so I remember it was the first season as well, just to get back into it, and they were, Aziz was talking about how it was a struggle for him being an Indian actor and trying to get main roles, and he was, him and this other Indian actor were both cast, they both wanted them to be in the show, but they didn't want to be typecast as doing the whole Indian accent when they weren't, in fact, like he was born in America, and yeah, it really tackles, I guess, the issues that face my, minorities, and yeah, like, right. Like a really nice show that you can look at other people's perspectives on life. There's a white male I haven't faced one. They face it. It's quite good to see and learn and educate myself while watching a show that I enjoy. It. And laughed and cried and yeah, it was great. And is that on? It's on Netflix, yeah. Yeah, it's on Netflix. So um, first season I think was like six or eight episodes, and then the next one was like ten, and then I think the third season is going to be shorter but it's, it's it'll be nice to see a whole new character i guess aziz might be in it as a minor actor but yeah like really showing the light of i guess a african-american woman who's of the in the lgbt community and her struggles so yes yeah, quite a good show yeah that sounds like it sort of opens it up to like potentially a lot more seasons where they don't necessarily need aziz as the central figure they can he could just be involved on the, the writing side, I guess. Yeah, definitely, because he wrote it with this guy called, I think it was Alan Yang, and Alan is in it as like a minor act, actor, like in a few episodes as a supporting cast member. So Aziz might be pushed back to do that as well, and they can tell more stories. So, And now a quick word from our sponsors. This week's episode of The Commentary Booth is brought to you by LF9 Designs. Are you in need of a new logo, event poster, Twitch overlays or emotes, or even merchandise designs? Look no further than LF9 Design for all of your graphic needs. The team there can create anything you need to suit all of your styles. Contact Luke at lf9designs at gmail.com or follow them over on Instagram at LF9Design. For me, the last sort of week has been documentaries, and particularly because there's a new one that has just begun airing again. But the the first one I checked out uh, while I was down at Lauren's house, actually, because her stepdad is a big fan, we watched the Tina Turner documentary on Binge called Tina. Oh, man. I love her. It's such a good documentary. Like, it follows her whole life and career from 
basically coming from nothing, simply just being someone that liked music. Then she went to see an Ike Turner show and got pulled on to start singing and then she married Ike Turner and then then things went off the rails there for a little bit because of how he was like quite abusive to her and then goes all the way into her resurgence as like an iconic rock superstar. Yeah, simply the best. I love her. I always thought growing up she was Australian because of that NRL commercial, but I realised that she's from Tennessee and um, now she's actually a citizen of Switzerland. But yeah, no, she's that sounds. Well, I love watching music documentaries. I'm done. I have a whole weekend off DJing this weekend. I'm going to watch that. Yeah, it's it's awesome. And speaking of that uh, NRL ad, I've got a pretty funny little story of my of little three or four year old Jamie with that song. Apparently, every time that ad came on the TV, I would come running from wherever I was in the house and just stand at the TV and watch that ad. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I could see that. I probably would do the same. Yeah, mum's, mum's got like these photos of little blonde-haired me standing in front of the TV just staring at Tina Turner singing Simply the Best. That is Simply the Best. I, that is adorable. I love that. That's wonderful. Yep. <laughs> and then in terms of like the documentary, I think the, the most revealing thing for me, like I, le- I learned a lot about her that I didn't sort of know, but the, the most revealing one was obviously the abuse that she went through with Ike. And then when she subsequently escaped, which like escaped is the correct term, she kind of just left a hotel room, ran across a five or six lane freeway got in a ra- another random hotel and then the next morning flew back to her house. But uh, when she got divorced, she gave him all of the rights and everything to all of the previous songs that they'd made together. Yeah. There was only one thing she wanted to keep and that was the name Tina Turner. Wow. Which was smart because it obviously had the name recognition and then she turned it into what it is today. Yeah, well. Uh, And then, obviously, with Tina Turner, that comes a lot of awesome music. So throughout the, I think it's like an hour and a half, maybe two hours, you get all of of the hits come through. Um, Just great. And then they they save Simply the Best till right near the end. I was like, play it the whole time, and it's right near the end. Wow. That sounds mad. It's great. I looked up some of the stats. It released on May 27th via HBO in America, but it's in Australia now on Binge. Apparently on that release day, it drew 1.1 million viewers in the US, which is second only to Leaving Neverland on HBO, which got 1.3 million. Wow. So that shows how big a star Tina Turner is. Yeah, wow. That's a lot of people. Mm Mm-hmm. Good on her. I love her. I'm I'm actually going to watch that with my mother. She loves Tina Turner. I'm going to go see her and watch it with her because that sounds like something would be nice for us to watch together. Yep. Yeah, I think I'm probably going to end up watching it again when um, mum gets back from her holidays and be like, do you want to watch the Tina Turner doco? Because she loves Tina Turner as well, and I'll happily watch it again. Oh, I love documentaries you can watch again, and... I always find music ones are so accessible to be able to watch again just because just you get lost in the music and that sounds like a good, good thing. I'm going to watch it for sure. Yeah, Tina Turner. You got me excited. I'm going to listen to her after this. I'm going to listen to her. I keep looking. There's a couple more. There's there's an Elvis Presley one now on Netflix as well, which I'm pretty keen to check out. And then there's someone else on Stan, but I can't remember who it is off the top of my head now. I saw one on, I saw one on Netflix about EDM, and they were interviewing like Carl. I, I didn't watch it, but I was. I, I just listened. They were interviewing like Carl Cox and Steve Aoli and Steve Aoki, and and they were talking about the resurgence and where it's been and where it's going. It was released a few years ago, but I think I need to. You prompt me. I think I have to watch that as well because music talk, besides Louis Theroux documentaries, music documentaries are probably my favorite thing to watch. They're amazing. Yeah, yeah, I can see you absolutely adoring 
all sorts of different music docos. Yeah, well, I'm not DJing this weekend, so I need to get my music fixed somehow. So here you go. Yeah, there you go. Learn up on the history. Yeah, amazing. Uh, and then the other documentary series that I've started that has just restarted, so I've been watching it ever since it first began. It's sort of right up my alleyway. It's called Dark Side of the Ring. Oh, yeah. I know the one. So season, season three dropped recently, and it's a Canadian documentary series produced by Vice, which focuses on the sort of controversial and sinister stories from the wrestling industry. Season three began last week with a two-part episode focusing on the life of the life, career, and death of Brian Pillman, who was uh, Stone Cold's tag team partner at one point, and then he split with Stone Cold and became the Loose Cannon Brian Pillman. Oh, Loose Cannon. Sounds like my wrestling name. What it would be? Perfect. I like it. It was basically him just acting crazy and being a loose cannon, and he did it so well that even wrestlers began to like question, is he like actually crazy? <laughs> because what he did, he was, his contract was coming close to an end and he was trying to bargain with WCW for some more money. And they essentially told him, you're not really worth that much. You got to do something to make yourself more, more marketable, more valuable. So he asked them to release him from his contract, which they did, which then allowed him to basically show up on any show at any time, anywhere, and he did that. He'd show up in ECW, he'd show up in WWE, he'd show up on random indie shows, um, he attacked announcers on shows, and then one of them like said the F word live on air, so then that got him a lot of attention. It was basically just him doing crazy stuff to get attention and essentially go back to either WCW or WWE because he didn't have a contract. He could freely negotiate with both at the same time. And it worked. He ended up getting paid a lot, although sadly he had a car accident, which then led to him having an addiction to pain medication, which then meant he was unable to perform to the standard he wanted which then made him get like more and more wild and crazy and eventually he died alone in a hotel room due to a heart failure oh god poor guy and that kind of opened everyone's eyes to okay these pain pain pills are pretty dangerous let's we probably should be regulating these a bit more yeah no that doesn't sound like oh poor, poor guy so yeah, that was that was a great opening sort of two part episode, and then season three is a total of fourteen episodes, which is more than the previous two seasons. Season one only had six, season two had ten, uh, and then so for season three, we've got the episodes focusing on Brian Pillman. The episode which comes out this week is called The Ultraviolence of Nick Gage, who is a hardcore deathmatch wrestler in the US who had a match with David Arquette. Okay. Oh, yes. That's right. We've... We spoke about this. Yes, that's right. We spoke about the David Arquette documentary. So now this one is... This episode will be the other side of that story where it's focusing on Nick Gage and his craziness. That's cool. Uh, We've got one called The... Collision in Korea, which is about a big show that involved, it was a 
cross-promoted show between WWE and New Japan Pro Wrestling that happened in Korea back in like the 80s or 90s or something. So that's wild to think that the two biggest companies in the world happily just work together. So I'm interested to see where that went. There's another episode about the Ultimate Warrior, who was another person that was just kind of a little bit crazy. Then we get uh, the the plane ride from hell, which is a story that like gets floated around in the wrestling circles about this plane ride where everyone was just playing pranks on everyone, and then Vince just flipped out because it was on his private plane. So that'll be funny one to listen to and then the other couple that I'm really interested in are Chris Canyon who is a wrestler who ultimately committed suicide I believe he was also gay I'm not 100% sure on that but I'm pretty sure he was and then the the steroid trial so when the government tried to clamp down on wrestling and Vince they basically accused Vince of supplying and requiring all his talent to take steroids. So that would be a very interesting episode. Oh, wow. So while I was doing some a little bit of research for this episode, I found out that a lot of the music in Dark Side of the Ring is by Wade McNeil, who is the vocalist and guitarist for one of my all-time favorite bands, Alexis on Fire. How I didn't know that beforehand. Yeah, wow. I love it when things like that happen. I was just looking through the Wikipedia. I was like, oh, hang on. I know that name. So that was a a cool little find. Um, And then sort of for anyone that's sort of thinking about watching this series in terms of going back and picking picking out a few episodes, I would recommend watching the the Montreal Screwjob. Yes, that's something I definitely want to watch because I've, I've heard about that and it's something that, yes, thank you. So that is that is a very good episode. It's yeah, forty odd minutes, and it tells you the whole story and then the the background of how it all came to be. Uh, then there's another episode about the killing of Bruiser Brody, who was a wrestler who was working down in Puerto Rico and got murdered in the locker room by a fellow wrestler. So, but that person was never caught. And then there's the Chris Benoit two-part episode. That's very heavy and tough to watch. Yeah, no, that's something I... Oh, no, yeah. I remember when that happened. That was horrible. Yep. And then there's the Brawl for All, which was the most ridiculous WWE pay-per-view of all time, I think. They basically tried to do UFC at the time because that was when UFC was sort of coming around with... They're just their regular wrestlers and so many guys got hurt and some of them like it ruined their career because of the injuries they got. Ugh. And then probably one of the, the best ones though is the last episode of season two, the final days of Owen Hart. Oh. Who uh when he passed away in the ring live on pay per view, so that was very heavy it's the highest rated uh program in vice history had 626,000 viewers yeah that doesn't surprise me at all for you i would recommend definitely the montreal screwjob like that is yeah such a good episode and apparently brett told vince if you come in this locker room I'm going to deck you. Oh. Vince came in, tried to apologize, got punched, took it like a man, just walked away. Wow. Yeah, no, this is, yes, I'm monstrous. I need to watch this. This sounds like, yeah, right up my alley. 100%. So, yes, season one and two are free on SPS On Demand. The other, season three hasn't hit SPS On Demand yet, but it's a, it's floating around on online at the moment. I know I've got SBS on demand on the app on my television, so I can. Yes, I'm going to definitely some music documentaries and wrestling documentaries. I'll wear my. I have a wrestling T-shirt. Nice. A, a random, random Stone Cold or the Rock one. Nah, 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 nah. I feel like, I feel like 
Kurt Angle. My second favorite wrestler of all time, and it says, "How many? You think you're impressive? How many gold medals do you have?" That's a great shirt. That's an awesome shirt. No, wait, it says I'm holding it now. It says you think you're special, and then it says, "Then tell me where are your gold medals?" Kurt Angle, WWF, 2001 World Wrestling Federation top. There you go. Very nice. Gotta love that. I love that whole series where they had to change from being the WWF to the WWE. Yeah, I was so confused by that as a kid, but I sound some WWE. I always remember watching Kurt Angle coming out and singing Sexy Kurt to Shawn Michaels. And Shawn Michaels is my favorite wrestler of all time. Kind of respected Kurt Angle for that, so I saw this shirt in an off shop recently, oh, not recently, about a year ago, and I had to buy it, and I love wearing it. Nice. Um, so that's all for me. Uh, you've been going back on a few things, I think. Yeah, so as, as we may have covered previously, I'm a bit of a creature of habit. I like to rewatch things and uh, comfort movies, comfort shows, and I've decided I want to start talking about the, the movies or the TV shows that I've, that I've rewatched. And um, this is a, a movie with Val Kilmer and, um, that I watched when I was in school. Um, I'd like to preface by saying that it's not a porno. It's called... <laughs> It's called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I'm sure there is a porno of that title. It wouldn't surprise me if there was a porno of that, but it's something I watched when I was in school. It came out in 2005. Um, Val Kilmer was in it, and I should have led with the fact Robert Downey Jr. is in it as well. Um, and when I, when, I was in, when I was in school, it's, we studied it, and it was... And we were studying postmodernism in advanced English or something. It was a bit of a blank. And I always, I was watching it and I was trying to think about what we studied. And it was nice to actually watch it and just I'll watch it with an open mind. And it's basically like a murder mystery crime thriller where it's, ba- it's based on a book. And Robert Downey Jr. looks so young in it. And Val Kilmer's called Gay Perry in it. Um, and yeah, just, and it's quite, it's also got Michelle Monaghan in it as well, who's this who's an actress, she was, she was actually in that grandpa movie we saw. What was that one called? With, um, we went to the movies. Oh, the war with grandpa. Yeah, yeah she, I believe she was in that as well. So yeah, it was, just, it was a, quite, quite a nice like murder mystery. It was a comedy, black comedy murder mystery. So it wasn't like a serious movie. Um, I've been actually thinking about it a lot lately and then I saw it pop up on Netflix and um yeah, basically, like, um, Robert Downey Jr. is, like, this, this, this petty thief in, in New York and he gets picked up to be an actor and he, he goes to L.A. and he gets, like, detective lessons and they end up investigating, like, a, a murder mystery and there's a bit of, like, a, a twist in it. And he, I think the postmodernism that they were talking about in school was he was doing a lot of talking to the camera and the rating and postmodernism, postmodernism's whole idea, idea was, like, projecting... Modern stuff, and yeah, it was quite, it was quite it was a light-hearted movie, and it was so weird seeing young Robert Downey Jr. in it because it would have been just before he became Iron Man and blew up and become one of the biggest actors in the world. And I think it was more of an indie movie. I believe it went to, I'll say, I'll say this wrong, but um, Khan, I believe it debuted there in two thousand five. Um, so it was more like an in, like a bit of an indie movie, but it was a great little hour and a half movie. It, I'm looking at it, this Wikipedia page now, and its budget was $15 million and its box office was $15.8 million. So they didn't make a lot of money on it. So they just broke even. But um, yeah, good, good little good little movie. And as a creature of habit, someone that likes to rewatch old movies, this is great. And don't be put off by the, the, the title. There's absolutely no, no X-rated content in it whatsoever. Oh, you do see some boobs. But yeah, besides that, yeah, it's a good movie. It seems like such a random movie to... For an English teacher to have chosen to study it must have been like your English teachers. Yeah, like they must have really enjoyed the movie or something. Because it came out in two thousand five, and I'm pretty sure we saw it in two thousand six. So somehow our English teacher decided I'm going to put this into the curriculum, and it's, I don't think it's something like you know you watch movies like I don't know when we young watch What's Eating Gilbert Grape when we were in like year eight, and that been out for years, so they could have like developed like things to teach about it. But then the teacher randomly just picked this movie that came out and. Within a year, we're studying it, and I don't really understand how. It, I don't really remember postmodernism, and 
was a weird time in my life, but we watched a, we watched a movie and saw some boobs when we were in school. I'm, I'm pretty sure when the teachers told us we see this movie called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, we were like, "What's going on here?" But, <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah, look, I liked. I liked. It was, it was nice to watch it again. So, each, I reckon each 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 episode I'm a guest on, I'll, I'll relive something from my teenage years that I enjoyed and we'll talk about it. it. Can be my throwback Thursdays. Yeah, it's like the movies that made Deckhead. Yeah, yes, that's it. That, I like it. That's, this, it's a new segment. We're introducing it. Lock it in. And that just makes... Then I don't feel bad about rewatching things I've watched before to talk about because it's a segment now. So we're on. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, what is your top recommendation for the week? Oh. I... I was going to, oh, can I say Wrath of Man and Master of None? Kind of a movie and a TV show because they're both so different, but they're both so good. Like, go see Wrath of Man in the movies. Phenomenal on the big screen. Guy Ritchie's a genius. But then you learn a lot in Master of None. So, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. I'm going to say both. How about yourself? That's all right. I was going to do a split choice as well. <laughs> Perfect. So for wrestling fans, I'm saying absolutely Dark Side of the Ring, uh, particularly the newest episode. I think the Nick Gage episode is going to be something to behold. Uh, but for everyone else, I highly recommend the Tina Turner documentary. Such a good watch. Okay, I will, I'm going to take your word for that, and I'm, I'm, I'm not. I don't know when I'm going to see my mother next, but. I've already texted her saying that we need to watch this documentary. So I've got a documentary we have to watch. So, yes, thank you for that. Perfect. Okay, so thank you, everyone, for listening to the commentary booth. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media at Jamyaps Media and at Pario Magazine. And you can follow Jackson on Twitter at Deckhead. Awesome. Thank you, my friend. That was fun as always.